I'm starting with two facts. Fact number one is that d3.js is a JavaScript library. I'm not actually I'm not actually amplified. Does anyone need amplification? Is it all good? Okay. Okay. Um, so d3.js is a um, a JavaScript library by Mike Bostock, who uh, works for a company called Cube. Um, it's uh, a JavaScript visualization framework. <coughs> Douglas, uh, Douglas Crockford says that JavaScript is the kind of most highly installed language interpreter uh, across the world. So if you're going to build any kind of visualization that you want to put out there to a lot of people and that's not necessarily in print, uh, I think JavaScript is a really good starting place. And I'm really, really excited about what we can do with it. Um, it's often said on the net that D3 is not a visualization framework. Uh, and I'm hopefully going to show, show you today that that's definitely not true. Um, when people say it, what they mean is that D3 is rather low level. So we have to put in a lot more work than we're used to with like matplotlib or ggplot. Um, it's also a lot more powerful. So we can do a lot of stuff with D3 that we could never hope to do with, with the kind of more standard uh, plotting tools that we, we know and love. Uh, and just in case you're curious, D3 stands for data-driven documents. And I'm going to show you what that means today. Essentially, D3 allows us to join uh, an array of data with elements on the web page. Uh, and that's its, that's its core um, competency. So uh, I'm going to start with some, uh, we're going to be using a data set throughout this talk. Uh, the data set uh, is mostly you guys. So this is um, all of your uh, pictures that you've happily uploaded to the meetup.com and that are now publicly available through the API. Uh, and so hopefully you can see yourselves. Uh, where's Drew? There you are. So there's Drew. And uh, so most people are kicking around in this graph somewhere. So um, I'm going to be using the, um, I've hit the Meetup API for a whole bunch of things. I think we've got uh, two other main examples apart from this one that uses uh, meetup.com's API. All of the code um, for getting that data is in Python. And that's up on the GitHub as well. Uh, so you can go ahead and get that. It's got my, my, uh, my API key in, um, please. Don't be mean or change it to your own <laughs> API key. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to do about that. Um, so yeah, be nice. Um, so this is the talk for today. So these are the four kind of main hurdles that we need to get over when using to starting to use D3. So I should tell you my background. It's, it's one of Python and R and a lot of exploratory data analysis. So working in JavaScript is a new thing for me. And these were the most painful things to get over uh, in that process. So I thought I'd uh, share them with you. These are also the, when I asked my friends what, what they were struggling with, the points that um, we came up with. So we're going to talk a bit about JSON. Uh, we're going to talk about how D3 makes selections and modifies the web page. I'm going to show you some um, of what Chrome developer tools uh, and alternatively, Firebug in Firefox can do. Uh, and I'm going to hopefully convince you that D3 is most definitely a visualization framework and actually contains a lot of high-level stuff to, uh, to build your visualizations. Um, so before I get going, can I see a show of hands who's, used, who's actually worked with and feels super comfortable with JSON data? OK. OK, good. So that's about, that's about half. So Jared, wherever you are, that was about right. So um, JSON is a, a, a nice data structure. It's used for um, passing information around on the web. And it's very common. Whenever we hit the Meetup API, for example, it returns us with JSON. Oh, that's Jared. Um, so it's really simple. It's really easy to use. And is a nice kind of replacement uh, for things like XML, which are a bit kind of clunkier. Um, this is basically all you can do with JSON. Um, so it's a key value store. Keys are always strings. Values can be strings. They can be Booleans, so trues and false. They can be lists. They can be um, arrays, so other key value stores, numbers, and the null uh, object. So uh, that's essentially all the things you can do with JSON. 
Um, and it's, it's very, very prevalent on the web and forms the basis for how we give uh, data to D3. Um, this is, uh, do jump in if you do have any questions, because I'm going to rip through the JSON bit, um, hopefully. This is a JSON that you can meet in the wild. So this is Drew's um, Meetup profile that he's happily uploaded to Meetup, and Meetup's made available to everybody else. Um, so you can see that all of this JSON is either um, string-valued or uh, occasionally uh, list-valued uh, and object-valued. So you can see, for example, that we can find out Drew's Twitter handle. We can see that he joined in 2009. Um, we can find a photo of him. We can find his profile page. We can find out his latitude and longitude. Um, That's not current. It's not <laughs> right now. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if it's where you were when you joined or if it's where you were when you last accessed the site. I don't know where the zip code information comes from because it's odd. Oh, yeah, we can find out where he lives. It's not where he lives. So, <laughs> but this is like a, um, a JSON that you find uh, out there on the web when you hit um, a web API. And we're going to be using JSON, not this one, um, <laughs> although this is the JSON we used to draw. I took everybody's profile and used that to draw the initial... Um, the initial graphic, but we're going to be using JSON like this um, today. Um, this is the golden rule when using JSON with D3. So this is the, the first thing that you've got to absolutely remember if you're using uh, JSON with D3, and that's not to store data in JSON keys. Uh, and this is um, Misha's golden rule. Misha is a colleague at Bitly who, uh, who coined the rule. So you've absolutely got to not store data in JSON keys. And to explain that, this is when I first came to JSON and wanted to build a time series um, data set, this is how I did it. So this is a time series. It's indexed by a uh, timestamp. So this is a Unix timestamp. That's the number of seconds since uh, the epoch was that January 1st, 1970. And then the value of the time series is um, the value of the JSON. And this is a terrible thing to do. Um, it's perfectly valid JSON, but you're going to find uh, real trouble using this kind of structure in D3. And what you should instead do is um, use the labels, use the keys as labels and the values to store your data. So this is a much um, better JSON structure um, when you're building your own kind of things. So that tripped me up for like a month. That was terrible. So, Uh, sure. So uh, the question was, I think, do you build a dictionary in Python and then use that to generate the JSON? Or use it as the data structure inside the Python script. Uh, yeah, so, so if, if I understand the question, yeah, I can generate JSON from a dictionary, and I can generate dictionaries from the JSON. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, it's JSON is wonderful because it maps... Um, really nicely onto Python dictionaries, and it maps absolutely onto JSON, uh, pardon me, onto JavaScript objects. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Sorry, yeah. but isn't your key usually unique? And here you're, you're creating the same, using the same key over and over again. Yeah, so for in each of these objects, I'm going to use the same, oh, sorry. So the question is, uh, shouldn't a key be unique? Uh, whereas here on the screen, we're showing uh, the same key used over and over again. Um, in each array, the key needs to be unique, but not in the overall JavaScript uh, object. So it would be awkward if um, it would be awkward in, if in this array defined between these two angle brackets, I had another time value or another value value. Um, but in this particular array, um, it's fine to have the same key. It's actually essential for when we use D3, and I'll show you. I'll show you that. We need to have repeated labels throughout the, uh, the array that we use. Now, that will be really clear when I start to show you some JavaScript. Um, please, if you um, build your own JSON, which is a relatively common task, or if you use a, um, a parser that you're not terribly sure about, check your JSON for validity. Um, you can quite easily paste it into jsonlint.com and it will give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down and that will save you from 
obscene and horrible errors that are really difficult to debug, um, you know, that will take you months to, to solve. It's a, it's, a really, it's, a, it's a really good sanity check if you're not using, uh, if you're using JSON that you've made yourself or um, some, some dodgy MATLAB parser or something. Um, that, that is real life bitterness. Um, uh, there must be. I don't know there. It's the Chrome browser extension that if it's not formatted correctly, it'll give you a okay. okay, so. JSON pipe is also wonderful. Okay, so the question was is there an offline version? The answer turns out to be yes. Mm -hmm. You can use the Chrome developer kit, uh, the Chrome developer um, tools, and JSON pipe. I don't know what JSON pipe is. You, you pipe in on the command line JSON and you get out a nice formatted version of it. Okay, so there's a command line tool. Um, to do this, and it will fail if your JSON is not valid. Brilliant, I love command line tools. Um, I like JSON link because it's pretty. Um, the other main point that I want to get across that's really, really important and that will save you from um, frustrating, weird errors in the browser is to serve your JSON using um, an HTTP server. Uh, this can be um, a huge ridiculous pain if you've got like a, if you're trying to serve this visualization up to a lot of people you need to think hard about this if you're just serving it up to yourself or um, you're doing a small visualization um, to share you can simply navigate in your terminal to the folder where you're storing the data and the visualization and run this command which starts up the Python simple HTTP server uh, on port 8000 um, this allows d3 to make an HTTP GET request to your data um, and will avoid cross-domain um, problems in the browser that uh, I felt like I understood and, and now I don't again. So I'm, I'm oscillating between understanding what the cross-origin domain error is. But it pops up all over the place and it can be mitigated by serving your JSON using uh, an HTTP server. And then this is our first piece of D3, which I shouldn't have put at the bottom. Apologies. But um, when we want to get data into uh, JavaScript so that we can play with it with D3, we use D3.json, which makes an HTTP GET request to its first argument. And then once it's finished downloading all of its data, um, sends it to the callback function, uh, which is the second argument. And it's this callback function that we're going to uh, massively focus on for the rest of the talk. Um, so just to, before I disappear down a JavaScript rabbit hole, for those of you that, like me, when you're starting playing with D3, didn't really understand how this all fit together, I wanted to give a quick overview of what you're going to need to build to make a valid visualization. So each D3 visualization comprises of four parts. The data, which doesn't have to be JSON, but um, we're focusing on JSON today. Uh, some HTML, so um, some web page that will contain some basic structure, uh, and most importantly, something which can be as simple as the body tag off of which to hang your uh, visualization. It needs some JavaScript, which um, in my experience so far, it can be almost pure, uh, purely using D3. And then some CSS, which I'm not going to talk about much today. I'll talk a little bit. But the CSS is, is essential to get your visualization looking um, pretty and uh, you know, a appealing to the, to the community. So we're going to focus almost exclusively on the JavaScript section now that JSON's out of the way. Um, but do keep in mind that this is all inside the structure of an HTML web page and a style sheet somewhere that's telling you what color things are. OK, so this is the first uh, example. This is my data. What I've done is I've gone and found how many topics everyone has listed on their, um, on their profile page. So most people uh, list no topics. Um, some people list a lot of topics. Uh, one person has listed 106 topics, um, which is great. Uh, and this is available on the GitHub profile. And it's a really simple JSON to start with. So we have um, a list. Each element of the list is this uh, array, this key value store. Count is the number of people, uh, and num topics is the number of topics that that many people said they were interested in. Uh, and we just have a, a big list. This is the HTML. I'm not going to show much more HTML today, 
but this is the web page that this visualization is going to live in. Two important pieces. First of all is the script at the top where we say we'd like to use uh, Mike Bostock's D3. Um, that's really important, that's nothing else will work. And then we've got a body tag here, which I'm going to hang um, visualizations off of, and that will make more sense in a minute. Uh, and then the script is where all the magic happens. So you've seen this line before. It's going to ask for data from the first argument, and then once it's finished downloading it, it's going to call the callback function in the second argument. Um, and we're going to, sorry, we're going to focus on, like I've said, we're going to focus exclusively on this callback function. Um, so here it is. This is the first one. Um, don't try and get this all into your brain immediately. We're going to see this pattern uh, over and over again for the next 20 minutes. Um, what I want to make sure is clear for this very first example is that we have selected at the top here, so, sorry, just to put this in context, here's the d3.json call that I've shown you twice now. There's where the data lives, so it's the numtopics uh, JSON which I've shown. And this is the callback, so once numtopics has finished downloading, it's going to call this function and pass it through the first argument. What I want you to get um, into your head now is the first two lines. So we've selected the body tag, um, which I've shown you, and appended to that an unnumbered list. Okay, so this is like a bullet point list. Okay, so that's the, the main thing I want you to get out of this, this first example, is that we, we need to choose something that's already in the web, uh, already in the web page, and we're going to append things to it. Um, this pattern, where we select uh, something that's already in the page, append a container, and then select all data, enter, and append a bunch of things in the data, uh, in the container, uh, we're going to see over and over again. But just, just roughly, these four lines let, allow us to associate an element in the web page with each element in our array. I'm going to say this three times, because I'm not like right now, but I'm going to go over this three times, because once you're over this, the rest is just great fun. Um, and then we, we write some text in the list element uh, that has, the, you'll see in a second. So once we run this code, this is what our web page is going to look like. So here's the body tag that we've uh, hung this visualization off. And all it is is an unnumbered list <coughs> with a whole bunch of list items. Okay, and this is quite long, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, so what we've done is used D3 to join the array that I've shown you, the JSON array, with a very, very simple bunch of web page elements. In this case, it's just basic HTML. It's like one of the first pieces of HTML you learn. Uh, it's just a, a really, really simple bulleted list. So this is what the top of it looks like. So we can see 44 people aren't interested in anything, um, six people interested in one thing, uh, one person, two, and so on, so on. Uh, and, and so it goes. So this is why people say that D3 is not a visualization framework, or is, I like to say it's not just a visualization framework, because we can build documents using regular HTML elements uh, using, uh, based on a data set, which is really powerful. What um, I hope is clear that, here's the full list by the way, yeah, 106, someone's totally interested in anything, it's brilliant. Um, what I hope is clear is that mixing, the, joining the data set with a bunch of list elements is absolutely no different to joining the data with a bunch of rectangle elements. So here's the, the list. A very tiny amount of code changes gives us a bar chart. So the simplest, the simplest kind of chart we could hope to use for this data set. Uh, and I'll show you how we do that. But I want to make it really emphasize this point that we're just joining data with various web page elements. And you, how you do that is up to you. D3 gives you that, that ability. At Bitly, we use D3 quite a lot to build um, list structures just to, to kind of visualize our own data. It's not graphics, but it's still useful for getting at data that you're, um, you're trying to discover things in. So for this bar chart, um, here's, the, date, here's the, um, the JavaScript. So again, this is d3.json. It asks for the data from the first argument. Once it's finished downloading, it's going to pass it into this callback function. And you can see it's the same structure, right? So we select the body of the page. 
we append this time an SVG element. So we're appending um, a, an element in which we can put um, SVG graphics. So um, uh, SVG stands for ooh, stands for scalable vector scalable, scalable vector graphics. Yeah, I wanted to say support. <laughs> So it stands for scalable vector graphics, and we can, it has a whole bunch of things that we can draw in modern browsers, of which I'm going to show off rectangles and circles today, outline lines and paths, I should say. So instead of appending an unnumbered list container, we're going to specify an SVG container. And in, instead of specifying um, list elements, we're specifying rectangles. And that's the, the only real difference. Um, I should say, instead of specifying text, we're going to specify the position and the size of the rectangles to build the bar chart out. So this is a really simple um, example. Uh, I'm going to start off with the width. Let me just show you there. So I'm going to start off with the width, which is kind of how long the bar is. And it's simply the count, which if you remember was in the JSON, multiplied by 11. And 11 is just a number that I mucked about with until it looked pretty on the slide. Uh, and much more about that later. Um, for each attribute that we want to set, we need to build these little accessor functions. So for every element of the uh, every element of the array that we specify comes in as D to these little accessor functions that we have to write for each attribute that we want to uh, set based on the data. Um, so here we take in the count. I'm going to go over this again because this took me ages to get my head around. So. I'm guessing this first exposure isn't um, too informative. We take the count and we multiply it by 11. So we're going to map the count. All that does is map the count into an appropriate number of pixels on the web page. For the Y position, so for the um, position on the uh, web page from the top of the containing element, which for us is the body element, I'm just taking the index of the element. So it starts off at 0, so the top rectangle is at 0. The next one has an index of 1, and so on. And I'm multiplying that by 24. And 24 is purely because my um, rectangles have a height of 20 pixels. And I think bar charts look a lot prettier if they've got bits of white space in between the bars. Um, but I just I chose that. That's my decision, uh, an aesthetic decision. So it's got a couple of pixels either side. Um, but essentially, again, all we're doing is joining an array that's stored in JSON with a bunch of elements on the web page. Uh, that's the kind of fundamental thing we need to get across with, with, when using D3. Um, oh, I should so this is the HTML that uh, we end up with for this bar chart. Uh, so we, you can see the rectangle has uh, Y properties, width properties, and height properties that we set using uh, the JavaScript. Um, so this is. Uh, going to be the interactive part that I'm interacting, uh, like the live part of the, of the talk. What I'm going to try and show you is that this pattern that uh, I've gone over again is, uh, actually makes sense and is something that we can, um, we can get to grips with tonight. All right, so hopefully this will work. OK, so the Web Developer Toolkit is a wonderful thing. Uh, and hopefully you can read those words at the back. Yeah? OK, good. So what we've got in this screen is this is the Web Developer Toolkit, um, which you can get by going to one of the menus or hitting Option, Command, I, and J. Uh, what you can see is the web page at the back there at the top. This is the HTML, uh, the elements of the web page. And then this is a, a handy JavaScript console where we're going to do uh, the magic. So uh, I've got it written down in case I forget. So I'm going to first of all load the data. Huh? Oh, wow. That was quick. <laughs> Thanks. Please do that, because it's going to happen lots. So I'm going to load the data, which I'm serving using the Python simple, well, Drew serving using the Python simple HTTP server. Um, OK. But he's doing it on one port higher than I'm used to, so that's this is the longest command I have to type in this particular demo. So if I can um, get through this, then we're all good. OK, and then I specify this function. And all I'm going to do is 
um, pass in the data once it's downloaded and assign it to a, um, a global variable, D. Uh, and that's kind of cheating. That's essentially just going to get the data set that I've stored, which is on the GitHub um, repository, uh, I've stored in meetuphistory.json uh, and put it into the console so that I can play with it. Okay, so there's D. The JavaScript, the, the Chrome Developer Console is wonderful because um, it allows you to do things like this. So what we've, what I've downloaded, um, oh, Drew. Um, Steve Jobs. Okay, um, so what I've downloaded is the um, information for every meetup um, uh, hack our uh, open statistical programming meetup um, <laughs> since the beginning. So this is the very first object in my array, and it's the, the very first um, R meetup that was in this date. Uh, date is in milliseconds, I think, yeah. since the epoch, which is like really good resolution for meetup <laughs> <laughs> uh, events. So these guys are accurate. Um, so this, whatever this date was, which is uh, back in 2009, Back in 2009, this was the name of it. So it was, um, it was quite, I guess, a lot machine learning with R, which uh, was only one third of the of the meetup. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, stuff. Great. So, and we know a bunch of things about it. Oh, the main thing that I want you to take away for the interact for the live demo is the yes RSVP count, which I'm going to graph against time, which is the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. So that's the first object. I'll show you the last object. Um, which is probably um, more appropriate. Oh. Um, sorry, Drew's, Drew's scroll goes exactly the wrong way. Um, <laughs> so this was the, um, the when Hadley came to visit. So I can't see the name. Oh, because it's down, down below? Oh, whatever. So this is when Hadley came to visit, and um, it got quite a lot more RHVB counts than the first... Uh, the first one that we saw. So what I'd like to do is make a time series graph of this um, for you. So that's our data set. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is select oops, is select the body of the page. Okay, so we've seen this twice now in the examples, but I'm just going to run. Uh, I need to put this at the top actually. Don't I? Hmm. Hold on, let me collapse the. Uh, the data so that you can actually see this. Is that better? Okay, so, um, yeah, we'll have to keep doing this. I thought about that. Okay, I'll put that high up over everyone's heads. Okay, so um, I've selected the body, and uh, so you can see that that's um, an HTML body element, and I'm going to start hanging things off this, um, off this element. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give it actually a variable so that I can refer it later. And I'm going to append the SVG element, uh, like we saw before. Okay, So all this is going to do is take the body element and add an SVG element to it. Okay, So now we have selected the SVG element. There it is. I don't know why it's called SVG, SVG element. Um, but the most important thing to see is that we've now got an SVG tag in the web page. So that's what that first thing does. Then I'm going to um, do a strange thing. I'm going to select all the circles in the web page, of which there are none. So this is the empty selection. Ooh, um, oh, man, I need to clear. OK, so this is the empty selection. I'm just going to clear that and do it again so you can see it. So I've, got, I've selected all of the circles in the page, of which there are none. So I have an array of length and zero. Um, what all we know about it is that its parent is the SVG element that I built. Um, did I give that? Okay, so I'm going to give that a variable name so I can refer to this empty selection. Um, no. Really? Okay. No, this is terrible. Okay, I'm going to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we'll just ignore that. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to select all the circles of which there are none, um, and then 
perform some magic. So I'm going to give, so C is an array of length zero, okay? I'm going to give it data, which we call D. Wait, so C is an array whose first element is in? Yeah, that's really confusing. No, it's an array of length zero. But I, those square brackets confuse me too. It could be a, a length one array whose first element is array with length zero. But that, which those square brackets would make sense. But um, I'm going to keep going. So, uh, so now I've appended data to this array. So now instead of having um, no elements, we've got 25 elements, but they haven't uh, actually got anything associated with them yet. So what I'm going to do is then enter this selection. And in the D3 documentation, this is called the entering selection. And it's really important because, oh, I'm going to clear the screen and do it again. It's really important because now we've associated a data point with every element in this array, okay? which is, if you've not seen this before and you've been trying to use D3, this was a really big moment for me. <laughs> so in the first array in this entering selection, we've got the first um, hack R meetup. And then in the... In the last element of the array, we've got the last hack R meetup that this API call returned, which is the Hadley, um, oh, there it is, tidy data. So this is the Hadley talk um, called tidy data. Okay, and all of the arrays in between are associated with different data elements. So we've taken that, um, we've taken this empty selection and blessed it with a, a bunch of data. Now everything we do with, um, Everything we do with this uh, afterwards is going to um, allow us to put more things into the web page. So I'm going to append to every to this entering selection. I'm going to append a circle, okay, which is great. So there's all my circles. So hopefully you can see. Hopefully it's a bit clearer now what this is actually doing. We're associating every element of the data with uh, an array, and for every element in the array, we're associating um, an, a, an, a web page element, in this case, an SVG element. So we've got a bunch of circles, um, but we still, obviously, there's nothing to see here because we haven't told Chrome how to actually render the circles. So we need to see their attributes. So I'm going to use, um, ooh, did I just delete the circles? Wow. Wow, I deleted everything. That's really spectacular. OK, good. Yep. I didn't think that could even happen. OK, great. Now, so we've got a bunch of circles on the floor. Sorry about that. So now I'm going to associate, I'm going to select all the circles in the scene, of which we now have 25. I'm going to specify some attributes. Now, for Chrome, to be able to render a circle, it needs its x position, its y position, and its radius. So we're going to go through. I'm going to do the x position first, because <clears throat> it's horrible. Because it's milliseconds since the epoch. It's not good, which doesn't map onto pixels in a, in a happy manner. So we have to specify this accessor function. So it takes in the data for each particular circle. And we say we'd like to return um, d.time except I'm going to subtract the very first, uh, I'm just going to pick it up out of, ooh, out of here, click. Totally going to show you scale after this, but this is just to motivate scale. Um, so I'm going to subtract that many um, pixels from d.time, and I'm going to divide the whole thing by a really big number that I determined earlier. <laughs> so what this is doing is I'm having to write this ugly hack um, to try and map the milliseconds since the epoch onto <coughs> pixels on the screen. And this happens to, uh, assuming I've got my brackets and everything right, happens to do that. Thank you. I think that's good. That's good. Right, so this, the great thing about the Chrome Developer Toolkit is that we can check how badly we've messed up our brackets, whether or not it shows things. So now you can see the CX property of every circle. 
uh, which is the x, which is the distance from the left-hand side of the containing element. And I'm going to do the same thing um, for the y, which is easier because um, it turns out that the number of RSVPs maps really neatly onto um, height. <coughs> Okay, so you can see that we're writing these little accessor functions to get at elements in the um, in the data that we built. Um, is that good? Yep. Okay, so we've written we've now got x values and y values in the HTML. Chrome needs one more thing, and that's the radius. So I'm going to set them all to the same value just to show you that you don't always have to have an um, an accessor function. You can just Pass in whatever you want. Uh, it can be six pixels. Does that work? Yep. Okay. So this has worked. There we go. Thank you. Thanks. So we can see that you know the hack R meetup started with such promise, and it was good for a while. And there were peaks, but really, it's tailing off. So we can go ahead and change this to the sad decline hack R. We've got a nice visualization that doesn't, you know, it's not happy, but it's, you know, the beginning of a, the beginning of a visualization anyway. Okay, and then of course we realized that Hadley showed up and like so did hundreds of other people, and we've just we've just buggered up the. Um, the R values, the the Y values, because Y starts from the begin, the top of the container, right, and not the bottom. Even though we're used to plotting things from uh, the bottom left hand corner, in D3 we need to remember to plot things from the top right hand corner, uh, the top left hand corner. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract 200, subtract the count from the height of the, the thing, um, and we've got something slightly more appropriate, and we can change the. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> hmm? Meteoric, meteoric. It. <coughs> Open statistical programming. That's the new name. <laughs> so, um, hopefully, I've shown. Hopefully, I've made the. Um, this d3 dot select all uh, dot append dot data dot enter dot append pattern a bit clearer. So I'll show you what what's happening. I've hopefully shown you what's happening when you try and uh, append your data to a whole bunch of web elements. Um, I also hopefully have I've gone through all of the third point as well, which is that the Chrome Developer Toolkit and the Firefox Firebug, which I think looks exactly the same as this, uh, is awesome and powerful, and that you should use it because it makes your life a lot easier. Um, before I stop um, typing, I just want to show you how to, um, we can get rid of this. I just want to show you that we can style uh, the page from here as well. Um, so I'm going to select a circle and I'm going to start styling it from here. So I like, um, I like medium sea green. I like, I think everything should have an outline and that is stroke, stroke should be black, that's brilliant. And then maybe if there's other points on this page, it's often good to have um, an opacity, say, Oh, how did I mess it up? Spelling, opacity, thank you. So um, we can build up visualizations live, we can style things live, which is an absolute godsend when you, when you don't know what you're doing with Chrome Developer Toolkit. What you'll normally do is write this all out in Vim or TextMate or whatever, save it, go to the browser, refresh it, realize that fill see-throughness is actually fill opacity, sort of get sad, go back to TextMate, change, hopefully you've got it right this time, go back to the browser, hit refresh, it's a bit better. Uh, this means you can just do that really, really rapidly, and it makes all the difference. Um, so uh, hopefully, I've 
um, covered the, my third point, which was you should totally use uh, Chrome Developer Toolkit, or if you've got upset with Google recently, which is totally valid, um, the Firefox Firebug uh, does the same sort of thing. OK, so I'm at 40 minutes, so I'm going to go through this last section quite quickly. So something that um, uh, Max chanted about uh, is uh, scale. So I don't really want to have to subtract the first time point and divide by 1 times 10 to the 8 if I, uh, all I need to do is map my input domain onto a range of pixels. And that's uh, exactly what D3 uh, scale objects do. So this maps. Um, so we have two scales shown on the, on the slide. And there's a whole bunch of other ones, like logarithmic ones and quantized ones and things I haven't played with. Um, because we've got a time series, I'm going to use a time scale. So what this, this is a constructor. What it actually does is maps uh, a domain on, of input. So in our case, this is dates. Uh, and we're going to use date objects to deal with the, the timestamps uh, onto a range of pixels. So I'm mapping the minimum time in my data uh, to 30 pixels, which is here. And I'm mapping the maximum time uh, to 730 pixels, which is on the other side there. Uh, and uh, similarly, for a linear scale, I'm going to map uh, 0, so no one showed up, no one RSVP'd yes, uh, up to the maximum number of RSVP counts that we saw onto this range, 280 to 20. And you'll notice those are back to front, which allows us to not have to ever worry about doing the, the subtracting from the bottom of the plot to the top. So if, simply by switching those, the order of the range around, we map 0 onto 280, and the, the largest value we got onto 20, which is up at the top of the screen, uh, and uh, we don't ever have to think about it again. We use those by... Um, Simply you pretending that they're functions. And I don't know enough JavaScript to know why this works. Uh, I'm just really happy that it does. Um, so what we do in our accessor functions that you've seen me write, instead of subtracting like some huge number and dividing, we just call time scale with the um, d dot time converted to a JavaScript JTOM, uh, date object. Uh, and then simply, uh, similarly, we use the value scale to convert the RSVP count into the number of pixels from the top of the page. So those are an absolute godsend, especially if you don't quite know what data you're going to be getting. So uh, we do a lot of stuff with live data. We kind of roughly know the domain that it's going to arrive in, uh, but we don't know exactly. So we can build times, uh, we can build uh, value scales that will just deal with anything that's, that's showing up at Bitly. Um, next bit, hopefully you've been slightly upset by the lack of axes. Um, D3 makes it really easy to build axes. So again, similar kind of constructor. Uh, we give it a scale uh, that we've already built. So the, this is the x-axis. We give it a time scale. The y-axis, we give it the value scale that we built on the last uh, couple of slides. Uh, and you notice that we orient the y-axis left. And then we have to do a bit, of, um, a bit of messing around, which reminds you that D3 is actually quite a low-level library. Um, these guys will both show up. Um, at zero, 0, so the top left-hand corner of the page, and it looks a mess. So you need to do a few things. You need to, for each axis, you need to append an SVG G element, which is a, a SVG group object, uh, into which you're going to put your axes, which is a whole bunch of lines and, and text. Uh, and then you need to give it a class so that you can scale it, so you don't end up with really ugly, big, fat axes. Uh, and then you need to translate it. So you need to translate it from 0, 0 for the x-axis. You need to translate it down to the bottom of the, uh, uh, to the, bottom of the visualization. And for the y-axis, you need to translate it across, um, well, across to the, uh, where the y-axis should be. And these are SVG transforms. Uh, and so that, what that's essentially doing is moving the group that you're going to store the axis in to the right spot, uh, which is a bit of a pain. but. Uh, and this is all in the context of the enclosing element, which is why those things are zero um, and not. Yeah. So this is all in the context of the enclosing element. And then you have to call the x-axis, which you built up here, similarly for the y-axis. So computationally, every time you do this, they have to retranslate. Uh, yeah. 
every single refresh. Yeah, absolutely. Is there well, when it refreshes, I think it's all always going to. Is there another way to maybe pre-process that translate so that it's not being done on every refresh? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, no, I'm not sure. So you wouldn't ever refresh it a lot. If you were going to have like an animation using D3, then you would do the animation inside of JavaScript rather than refreshing the page. So you typically would... Sorry, I should repeat the question. The question was, can you kind of hard code the um, translation of the axes uh, so that it doesn't happen on refresh? But everything happens on refresh, so I don't know. You wouldn't really want to, right? Because the frame pixels might be different on different people's browsers. Yeah. It's, it's fast. It's all done asynchronously. So it's yeah. Fast. It's not, yeah, it's not, it not common. I'm just curious for more complicated drafts, an extra level, you have to translate everything mm -hmm. at some point that. You could <laughs> generate the SVG and then save the SVG and then load yeah, it in. I mean, it's, it's just HTML again. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, this is the penultimate example slide. Um, I'm using up my time. This is a line constructor, so we can make our time series look a little bit more like a time series. Um, again, it's a constructor. This time we pass it uh, x and y, and you'll recognize these accessor functions from, uh, from the earlier examples. And what this does is it allows us to draw an SVG path, which normally are really rather painful to construct. Um, they're a little confusing. I've never figured them out because I've always had d3.svg.line. Um, and what this essentially does is it takes our data and then builds the, the line, builds the path, the SVG path, that you would have to do manually uh, for us, which is um, wonderful. It saves us a lot of time. So drawing lines is actually really rather easy using this, this constructor. Uh, and it's really simple. We just um, have to create a path element. We give it a class so that we can style it properly. And then... Um, pass in the D attribute, which I think stands for data, but I've never really looked up. Um, we pass in for the D attribute this uh, line constructor with the data as its first uh, argument. And uh, yeah, it gives us this line. We can, you can pass in, there's various interpolation modes, so this is linear interpolation. Uh, I think there's a B spline and a zero order hold, at least, um, if, that's, if that's the kind of thing you need. Uh, it's using the, yeah. What was the question? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. The question was, um, does the path looking correct depend on the data being in the right order? And uh, I'm pretty sure, to almost totally sure, that the answer to that is yes. It needs to be sorted. So I've definitely pre-sorted this list according to the time. Um, the nice for uh, x-axis for you got years sometimes and months. You did that. That's not something. Give me a reasonable interpretation of milliseconds as the epoch. Oh, right, no. So D3, the D3 time scale does that for me. Oh, really? Which is, a, which is brilliant. And so far, it's done it well. Um, Matplotlib occasionally does it badly, <laughs> um, which you may have come across. And this so far has done it very well. I think the reason that it does it well is that Mike Bostock belongs to a company called cube and they have a product called square that is purely for time series visualization and so they'll have thought about this a lot and nailed it um, I haven't used it enough to be like it always works wonderfully but so far it's worked great and I really really value not having to think about it because I've had to think about it too much so far in my life um, that's the first high value thing I've seen a lot of the rest is like you could do a jQuery basically but this is, this is starting to yeah, the high-level stuff. There's the the majority of the D3 API is high-level stuff. So constructors that allow us to do drawings, um, sort out the scales, the axes, and then there's a whole big pile of layout things for the more fancy um, graphs and and things that you'd want to draw. Um, I'm certain that you could just lay out SVG by hand, um, but the D3, the the core D3 takes care of that for you in a, in a really nice way, I think. Um, this is the last, uh, the last bit. So D3 is really powerful for transitions and um, interaction. 
I haven't really sh talked about those much because they would be the, the fifth kind of hurdle. The, the main thing I want to show is uh, a very simple interaction. So what we've specified here is that for each circle in our graph, I'm going to give it um, an on mouse over event. And the, uh, so we can have on takes in as first argument the um, type of event, and these are just standard JavaScript events. Uh, this one, the top one is a mouse over, and what I'm going to do is append a piece of text that takes in its x and y attributes to be the x and y attributes that we've been using for the circles, plus, uh, plus five pixels each time, so it goes down to the right. Uh, and then its text is going to be the name of the um, the name of the meetup. So you can see that we can like build in really kind of quick little tooltips, which means that in sort of interacting with the visualization is is really simple and easy. Um, and this is something that coming from a matplotlib or uh, a ggplot background is like comp we could never do this, right? Like. Imagine maybe in some world you could if you put an amazing amount of effort in, but for D3 for like eight lines, um, it's amazing. Oh, so the important thing uh, I think is to make sure that these things have a class so that when I do the mouse out event, I can select all of the text with the class tip and get rid of them so they don't litter my um, uh, page. And so hopefully you can at least sense the the um, potential for making really, really complex uh, interactions, um, given that this is such a small amount of code. Uh, yep? Yeah, question. Uh, could, you, could there also be like an on feature so you can click on it and say open up the web page and like Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Oh, sorry. The question. <laughs> so the question was, can there be an on click event so that you can um, uh, trigger some something like, for example, opening the meetup profile page, and the answer is most definitely yes, and that's uh, that's really easy to um, to implement. Um, okay, so um, that's the that's the last example. So to summarize, um, Misha's golden rule for JSON is don't store data in the keys, uh, and you've seen now why that's important because we refer to the key for every element of the pay, uh, of the uh, data in order to get at it. So if these were different for each value uh, in the arrays that we build, it would be a, it would be a little nightmare. Um, this pattern of selecting all of the elements that aren't there already, blessing them with data, entering them, which is kind of like doing for each, but not quite, uh, and then appending HTML or SVG elements. This is the basic D3 pattern, and once you've nailed this pattern, the rest is all just having fun with the API and drawing all of the chord diagrams and the animations and the Veroni diagrams and the whatever you've seen online. Um, the Chrome developer tools, I think, are super important. Uh, and Firebug, which I haven't tested but will be, I think, as far as I understand, is almost exactly the same as the Chrome developer tools. I don't know if anyone can, can confirm that. So uh, a bit Firebug's a got more to it. Brilliant. So, and then, despite what people write on the internet, D3 is definitely a visualization framework. Um, and I say this because of the richness of the high-level API stuff. Once you've like, eased yourself over this 